This was supposed to be a quick video for easy clicks, but nope! It turns out that Power Girl's costume is one of the most weird and all over the place things in all of comic history. And this chest hole is actually an endless rabbit hole of behind the scenes changes and controversy, and it is weird. It's safe to say that one of the things that I really enjoy about superheroes are the cool logos and branding associated with them. I mean, hell, my background is a testament to that. Although Marvel has plenty of characters without logos like Thor, the Hulk, and Wolverine, Power Girl is one of the only prominent characters at DC without one, and she even goes a step further by straight up removing that part of her costume altogether. I really like Power Girl as a character. I mean, yes, as a straight guy, I think that she is hot as hell, and I am extremely grateful for all of those great cosplays over the years. But on top of that, she's an enjoyable three-dimensional character. However, there's no denying that to most people, she's only known for her boob window. But here's the thing, the history behind the hole in the costume and the controversy surrounding it is legitimately fascinating, and it goes absurdly deep. So if you have some time to kill, then join me on this really weird journey. Now before we get too far into things, I know I'm going to be talking a lot about boobs in this video, and I might get demonetized, so I seriously want to thank Magic Spoon for coming back and offering to sponsor this video to make sure that it makes at least a little bit of money. Part of the reason why I'm confident enough to wear this shirt in the first place is because I've been taking my fitness a lot more seriously, and Magic Spoon being a healthy and mm, just delicious cereal has been a legitimate help. I have been obsessed with the maple waffle flavor, along with many other great tasting ones like fruity, peanut butter, frosted, cinnamon, and the constant limited edition drops. Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving, totaling in at only 140 calories. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and wheat-free, and they just started shipping to Canada and the UK, so there is no better time to try it and see for yourself. Go to magicspoon.com slash drake and use the code drake at checkout for $5 off. If you don't like it, there's a 100% happiness guarantee for a full refund, no questions asked. Seriously, thank you very much, Magic Spoon, for being a constant recurring sponsor, but now let's get back to the video. Okay, so who is Power Girl and what's her deal? Well, she made her first appearance in All-Star Comics number 58 in 1976 and was created by Jerry Conway and Rick Estrada. She's from the alternate universe Earth 2 and is the doppelganger of Kara Zor-El, aka Supergirl. However, her creators wanted their version of the character to stand on her own and be noticeably distinct from her mainstream counterpart. Power Girl was a lot more independent, headstrong, and was a staunch feminist. So having a radically different costume from Supergirl was a top priority. As far as design, the chest window was always a critical part of her costume, with Jerry Conway having this to say on Twitter. Quote, the true dumb reason for the circle? At the time, it was a convention for hero costumes to have a chest symbol. I thought a giant P looked silly. The circle was intended as a nod to convention without being conventional. Not a sexy thing at all until Wally Wood zinks. Now, Wally Wood is where the story starts to get really interesting, and sets the stage for the rest of Power Girl's long and complicated history. This dude was well known for his sexy work, and infamously the Disneyland Memorial Orgy poster that he drew for a magazine called The Realist. There is so much going on in that picture that if I tried to censor it to meet YouTube's guidelines, it would basically just be a solid black rectangle. So if you really want to see it, it is very easy to find online. And even back before the internet, Wally Wood claimed that it was one of the most pirated images of all time, so you can find it. Anyway, Wood was the inker for All-Star Comics, which means that he went over Rick Estrada's pencils with ink, and that also means that it was Wally Wood at the end of the day who dictated what the final lines for the book would look like. There's an alleged story in the comic fandom that's been brought up by multiple industry professionals that Wally Wood didn't think that the editors at DC were actually paying much attention to anything that he was doing. And so to test the limits of what he could get away with, Wood decided to increase the size of Power Girl's boobs every single issue to see how long it would take for someone in editorial to say something. Now, personally, I don't think there's really much of a difference in the size, but maybe I'm just blind. So you can take a look at the images for yourself, come to your own conclusion, and let me know what you think down there in the comments below. Regardless, Power Girl's over-the-top bust was a noticeable breakaway from DC's policy in the past, which stated, quote, the inclusion of females in stories is specifically discouraged. Women, when used in plot structure, should be secondary in importance and should be drawn realistically without exaggeration of feminine physical qualities. Wally Wood was only on the title for a little bit, but the legacy and controversy of Power Girl as a sexy character had been firmly established at her very inception. And from here on out, debate about her costume became an all-out war. 
According to Jerry Conway, DC's editor Jeanette Kahn thought that the boob window was a bit sexist and requested that the hole be closed. But since Conway still thought that her running around with a big pee on her chest would look dumb, Power Girl's new modified outfit, which had her covered up to her neck, was still logo free. In the comics, Power Girl's teammate, the Star Spangled Kid, got the ability to make pretty much anything he could imagine, and the very first thing he created was an insignia for her new costume. When the kid gave it to her, Power Girl crushed the emblem to dust right in front of him, exclaiming that he's a chauvinist piglet for even assuming that she would want to wear Superman's crest, but with a P. Look, I get that Kara wanted to be seen as her own person separate from her cousin, but the kid was just trying to do a nice thing for her, and she went about it in the rudest way possible. The new costume only lasted for a couple of issues, abruptly changing again. At the beginning of issue 69, nice, Power Girl was covered up to her neck, but then on the very next page, her costume had a scoop neck with no explanation, and it stayed that way until the end of the series in 1978. I personally think that this was a healthy compromise. Opening up the neckline is less conservative, but it's also less likely to be taken as inherently sexual. But then again, it's possible to be sexy without showing much skin. But now, things got a bit messy. See, continuity over at DC Comics was getting a little out of control. Telling stories in multiple universes, acquiring other comic publishers, and so much more was making things overwhelming for new readers, which is why DC decided to streamline things by taking the little bits and pieces that they liked from the multiverse, shoving them in one universe, and then destroying the rest. This event was known as Crisis on Infinite Earths, and if you want more information about that, then you can check out my video on DC's reboots and the one that I did about every crisis. Anyway, one of the things that DC wanted to streamline was the Superman mythos. After all, it's hard to focus on Superman being the sole survivor of Krypton when other characters like Supergirl and Crypto the Superdog are also flying around. So the company chose to not include them in their new singular universe, even giving Supergirl a big send-off by killing her on Crisis on Infinite Earths, leading to one of the most iconic images in all of comic history. However, Power Girl was a pretty popular character in her own right, and even headlined her own miniseries a few years back. And she was visually distinct enough from the rest of the Super Family to stick around in the new universe. There's a few problems with that, though. One, Power Girl is from Earth 2, which is no longer around. Two, Supergirl was tragically killed, so bringing her back, even an alternate universe version of her, would feel cheap. And three, DC doesn't want more Superman characters, and despite having a unique outfit, Power Girl definitely is one. Their solution? was pretty fucking weird, and one of the strangest things to ever happen to Power Girl. So DC decided to retcon Kara's entire origin to be a magical lie. Distraught about her place in this new universe, even though canonically nobody except this dude was supposed to even remember that the multiverse had ever existed, Kara went back to the ship that blasted her to Earth all those years ago. But it turns out that it wasn't ever a spaceship. It was a magic crystal, and a vision of a man appeared from it. His name is Arion, and he is an ancient sorcerer from Atlantis. He's also Kara's grandfather, apparently. So Arion dumps all of this lore on Power Girl, revealing that she was never from Krypton, she's actually an Atlantean, and Arion had put her in stasis for 45,000 years in order to be kept safe from her evil wizard great-uncle. He also looked in the future, crafted the false Kryptonian identity for her, and magically implanted those memories because comics. Arion also decided to mark Kara with his crest, but instead of it going on her chest, he put it on her belt. Custom-made emblem handcrafted by a friend? Not acceptable because it was too similar to her cousin's. Symbol of a long, long, long-lost grandfather that you never even knew existed? Perfectly fine. Inspired to learn more about her Atlantean heritage, Power Girl traveled to Scarteris, a dimension of swords and sorcery that was colonized by her ancient ancestors. In order to blend in with the fashion sense of her realm's old-school inhabitants, Power Girl wore this disguise, opting to wear a tunic over her costume and throw on a headband along with belts that defined each of her boobs. Honestly though, it's a lot less revealing than the outfits of many other residents of Scarteris, so I am legitimately surprised by the artist's constraint. After this brief excursion to this archaic land, Power Girl went right on back to Super Heroics, complete with the same costume that she'd been wearing for the past 10 years. But as time went on, her neckline noticeably got lower and lower until it became the 90s, which is no doubt the worst time for costume redesigns ever. I actually have a dedicated video going over some of the worst, and man, I should really do a sequel to that one. So, at this point in time, Power Girl was a member of Justice League Europe, and the writers had no idea what to do with her. As Keith Giffen put it, quote, When Justice League Europe was gearing up, we were handed a list of characters, and Power Girl was one of them. To be honest with you, at first, I didn't want her. 
In that same interview, he also said this, quote, when we got her for JLE, I just thought she was angry and stacked. Stacked and angry, that's pretty much how we looked at her. Despite her rack literally being one of her defining qualities now, this incarnation of Power Girl didn't really want to be seen as sexy, and the art reflected that, since almost every single panel she ever appeared in had Power Girl looking grumpy with an unflattering scowl. She also hated being seen as a sexual being, and when being objectified by her fellow teammate The Flash or the general public, she lashed out. But okay, what about the terrible 90s costume that I alluded to earlier? Well, we got this golden monstrosity. Once again, Power Girl was covered up to her neck. Or she might be. Yeah, it looks like the colorist could never quite figure out if these sections of her arms and back were supposed to be white or cutouts. Hell, even the page where this costume was first revealed had two conflicting depictions. Eventually, Keith Giffen would leave the book, fully handing it over to his co-writer, Gerard Jones. Hey, so quick pause here. I found out while editing this video that this writer is actually in prison for possessing and distributing CP. Normally, I would have called that out in the script itself, but I just didn't know. So yeah, fuck that guy. And this guy wasted no time in redoing the costumes of most of the JLE. So of course, Power Girl got yet another makeover, with this one somehow being worse than the last costume. Power Girl is now rocking a red, white, and blue color scheme, meant to symbolize her Atlantean roots, since they're the colors of Arion, which once again means that her costume is being defined by her relationship to another character, which is a huge step back from her origins. But you might have noticed a pretty big addition. The boob window is back, and now it's a diamond. This abrupt costume change came along with a new perspective on how Power Girl viewed her sexuality. See, when donning the new outfit for the first time, Kara got into an argument with her fellow teammate, the Crimson Fox, who has always flaunted her stuff and believed in controlling men through her sex appeal. Kara clapped back with, This costume shows what I am. Female, healthy, and strong. If men want to degrade themselves by drooling and tripping over themselves, that's their problem. I'm not going to apologize for it. However, it was revealed just two issues later that she was trying to adhere to the male ideal of the female body, which is why she tried to lose weight, by drinking diet soda. Oh, and quick side note, this issue also decided to add the detail that all of Kara's rage issues were actually caused by the diet soda, and they treated it like a drug addiction. Your state of mind concerns us all, Kara. What's in your bag? Not more diet soda, I hope. It was just a weird choice. This new costume lasted for the entirety of this Justice League series, but as soon as it ended, Kara popped up in the Aquaman books, now reverting back to the classic design with a minimal neckline, for no reason whatsoever. Though, it is kind of odd that the moment that she went to an Aquaman book, Power Girl ditched the costume that was meant to reflect her Atlantean roots. A year later, Power Girl popped up under the control of the goddess Nike, and since writer Chris Claremont has a fetish for mind-controlled women in dark, skimpy outfits, Kara was no exception. Power Girl was freed from Nike's mind control and wore her usual outfit until, bam! This random ass series that no one cared about called Body Doubles brought Power Girl in as a guest star, and look at that! The classic costume with the original iconic boob window is back. This was the first time that Power Girl went back to her original costume, and it only took 23 years. So now that Power Girl is back in the costume that we all know and love, that's the end of the video, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Almost immediately afterwards, the chest window was taken away and replaced with the low-cut neckline. But then after that, Power Girl was put back in the god-awful white and gold costume, which covered her up to her neck again. This was because she was guest starring in the all-female book Birds of Prey, and one of the editors thought that this outfit would better fit the tone of female empowerment. But much like the last costume, the neckline was dramatically lowered as time went on, later becoming a weird amalgamation of all of her previous costumes. All this change was apparently too much, and one of the higher-ups at DC realized that this costume would affect the branding, merchandising, and recognizability of Power Girl, so they demanded that she be changed back. Returning to the scoop. This only lasted for a couple of issues before Power Girl got her chest window back, and I am finally happy to report that after all of this constant back and forth and this and that, this was finally the time that Kara's costume would be cemented as the one that we know today. Or would it? See, now that Power Girl's original windowed costume became the status quo, she became a punching bag in the industry and fandom. Multiple stories were written that leaned into her sex appeal, and the writers were desperate to justify Kara's choice in attire. 
One scene had Kara talking to a teammate who explained that the boob window was important because contradictions are who she is and what she does. That the hole draws in the eyes of villains and puts them off balance. That her name says girl, but her body says woman. And then you have the most infamous page in all of Power Girl history where she talked to Superman about her boobs. People always ask me why I have this hole right here. They think I'm showing off or just being lewd. But the first time I made this costume, I wanted to have a symbol like you. I just, I couldn't think of anything. I thought eventually I'd figure it out and close the hole, but I haven't. DC Comics even tried to parody the chest window by introducing Power Boy, a male character with a similar costume, highlighting the fact that a dude wearing this outfit looks like a goddamn idiot. Also, Power Boy was a weird Supergirl stalker, and she kicked him in the nuts. It didn't matter how hard writers wanted to lampshade or parody it, Power Girl's boob window was here to stay, which once again caused outrage from people thinking that her outfit was sexist. I love how DC tried to do a compromise by leaving the hole, but giving her pants instead. It's done with no explanation too. Like, Power Girl is just hanging out with Batman, and in another panel, suddenly, there's pants. You think she was just trying to make him more comfortable, or what? And then the pants went away a couple issues later with no explanation for that either. Anyway, this brings us to Flashpoint, which completely rebooted the DC Universe for a second time. Again, check out my videos on DC's crisis events and their reboots if you want more information. In this new status quo, Power Girl was removed from the main universe and put back on Earth 2. And in this universe, she's Supergirl, but she got sucked into a portal during an alien invasion and now she's back in the main universe. Now stranded in this strange new world, Kara decided to take up a new identity, Power Girl, complete with a new costume featuring a big ol' P emblem. The very thing that her original creator thought would look stupid, because, surprise, it does. Fans instantly hated the new outfit, which is why during a fight, her costume was ripped in a very specific area, teasing fans on what they were missing out on. But then about a year later, it was torn way worse during a team up with Supergirl, whose Fortress of Solitude whipped up a new outfit for her as a replacement, and wouldn't you know it, it's the classic suit. Eventually, Power Girl returned to Earth 2, only to watch Superman die. So to honor his legacy, Clark's emblem was given to her, it magically grafted onto her suit, and it completely covered the chest window. But at least this time, the emblem was earned and felt like solid character growth. But hey, let's throw all of that out the window, because DC decided to bring back the pre-Flashpoint Earth 2, and as of the time of this recording, Power Girl is back to the costume that we all know and love. Look, at this point, Power Girl's costume is iconic, and in my opinion, it shouldn't be changed. She is a fantastic three-dimensional character, but by putting this much emphasis on the back and forth of removing and putting back the chest window only serves to emphasize that it's her boobs that are her defining characteristic. Yes, there is a problem with the over-sexualization of female comic characters, but at the same time, there is a place for some of them. Femme fatales that use their sexuality as a weapon are a fun archetype, but also characters that are proud of their body and show it off for their own empowerment is also good character writing. Yes, Power Girl was created and is mostly written by men, but folks like Amanda Connor, who drew the definitive Power Girl series, get it. From her very inception, Power Girl was made to be a feminist icon, and maybe I'm just talking out of my ass here as a dude, but I don't think feminism inherently means covering up, which is probably why so many cosplayers choose to dress up as Power Girl. I sincerely hope that this is the end of the literally decades-long debate about this character's costume, and we can focus on what really matters. Great stories. But if you like this video, then why not consider subscribing, or even watching another one? I did not expect this topic to go on for so goddamn long, so please subscribe. I would really appreciate it so this Descent into Madness was worth something. And if you want to watch more videos, I have a playlist with every single one of my Superman videos I've ever done. I'm going to get to editing on this and try to regain some bit of my life back. Hope you enjoyed this, and hopefully I'll see you next time.